The East End of London, 1888. Picture smog. Picture dark, craggy streets and tall rock buildings brimming with immigrants with nowhere else to go. The chatter of a dozen languages echoing through man-made canyons never ending. You pack that many humans on top of each other, you're asking for trouble. This is the parish of Whitechapel, end of the road for Irish and Jewish people fleeing their homelands seeking safety, seeking work, seeking vice and pleasure. It was the eight mile of its time, the Compton of London. It was a dangerous place at night, and decent people stayed indoors. Those ingrates who ventured out could visit some 62 brothels that employed 1,200 prostitutes. This was a certain kind of hell, and it attracted a devil. It was around 1 a.m. in the early morning hours of August 31st when Mary Ann Nichols walked out of a pub and went looking for a warm place to sleep. She usually stayed at a hostel on Thrall Street with her roommate Emily Holland. But that night, she was turned away because she didn't have the fourpence it cost for a bed. She told the caretaker she'd be back after selling her services on the streets. Around 2.30 a.m., Nichols' roommate spotted her at the corner of Osborne and Whitechapel. Nichols claimed to have already made three times what she needed for the bed, but had spent it on alcohol. Emily Holland continued on to the boarding house, and unfortunately, the next trick Nichols turned would be her last. A man named Robert Paul was walking to his job at the Covent Garden Market at 3.45 a.m., when he came across a man standing over a body. This man ran to Paul and said, come look at this woman. The two of them walked over and Paul saw it was a woman lying on her back, her skirt pushed up. He reached for her wrist and discovered it was already cold. The woman was dead. He pulled the skirt down to give her some dignity. The first thought on Paul's mind was that he didn't want to be late for work. This was a seedy section of London after all and a morning homicide wasn't exactly shocking. He told the other man, who gave his name as Charles Cross, that he would send the first policeman he found. He did just that, and soon the police were processing the scene. They sent for a doctor who arrived at 4 a.m. The doctor discovered that the woman had been dead for only about a half hour. Her throat had been slit, and she'd been mutilated by a knife, stabbed over and over in her stomach. They identified the victim as Marianne Nichols. More bodies followed. All the victims were women who worked the streets of Whitechapel. Annie Chapman on September 8th, Elizabeth Stride three weeks later, and then Catherine Eddowes just an hour after that one. Nobody had yet invented the term serial killer, but Sir Robert Anderson knew he was dealing with a monster unlike any the city had seen before. Anderson was the assistant commissioner of the London Metropolitan Police, and it was up to him to stop this man. But how does one stop something he doesn't fully understand? How do you search for a killer who didn't know his victims, who nobody could identify? Anderson reached out to Dr. Thomas Bond, a renowned surgeon, to get his opinion on this strange case. Bond reviewed the autopsies of the four victims and showed scientifically, how they were similar, confirming the suspicion that one sick man was responsible for all of the murders. But then Bond went further, writing, the murderer must have been a man of physical strength and of great coolness and daring. There's no evidence that he had an accomplice. He must, in my opinion, be a man subject to periodical attacks of homicidal and erotic mania. The character of the mutilations indicate that the man may be in a condition sexually that may be called satyriasis, 
It is of course possible that the homicidal impulse may have been developed from a revengeful or brooding condition of the mind, or that religious mania may have been the original disease, but I do not think either hypothesis is likely. The murderer, in external appearance, is quite likely to be a quite inoffensive looking man, probably middle-aged and neatly and respectably dressed. I think he must be in the habit of wearing a cloak or overcoat, or he could hardly have escaped noticed in the streets if the blood on his hands and clothes were visible. Assuming the murderer to be such a person as I have just described, he would probably be solitary and eccentric in his habits. Also, he is most likely to be a man without regular occupation, but with some small income or pension. He is possibly living among respectable persons who have some knowledge of his character and habits, and who may have grounds for suspicion that he is not quite right in his mind at times. Such persons would probably be unwilling to communicate suspicions to the police for fear of trouble or notoriety, whereas if there were a prospect of reward, it might overcome their scruples. And there it is, the first psychological profile of a serial killer. It was a new way of considering a crime, a new tool for investigation, this consideration of a killer's mind. Bond's profile of the Whitechapel suspect would inspire an entirely new field of study, as well as countless books and movies. A bit of science, a bit of deduction, a bit of bullshit. They never did catch the man responsible for the Whitechapel murders, by the way, but they did eventually give him a good serial killer name. They called him Jack, the Ripper. This is The Philosophy of Crime, and I'm your host, James Renner. Psychological profiling may have started with Dr. Bond and Jack the Ripper, but it didn't become an accepted tool for detectives until the creation of the Behavioral Science Unit at the FBI in 1972. This new department was considered to be the X-Files of its time, regarded with suspicion by older agents who were trained to follow the evidence, not to daydream about the motivations of unknown suspects. The idea for the new department came from the mind of a man named Howard Teton, a Marine Corps sergeant who'd worked as a photographer in the Korean War. When he returned from overseas, he got a job as a police officer in California and attended criminology classes at UC Berkeley. He started noticing parallels between the things he was learning in his abnormal psychology classes and the suspects he encountered working crime scenes. He wondered if the tools of psychology could be applied to police investigations. After graduating, he accepted a job as an instructor at the FBI's training facility in Quantico, Virginia. There, he partnered with another agent, Patrick Mullaney, a psychologist. Together, they changed everything about the way detectives investigate serial killings. Their motto was simple, study the victim to reveal the psychology of the killer. Teton and Mullaney may have created the behavioral science unit, but two other agents get most of the recognition, John Douglas and Robert Ressler. It was Douglas and Ressler who traveled to prisons across the country to interview men who had been arrested for multiple murders. Men like Edmund Kemper, the so-called co-ed killer, who killed and dismembered 10 people between 1964 in 1973. For three years, Douglas and Ressler traveled the United States interviewing the scariest criminals known to man. They were gathering data without judgment, attempting to find patterns in behavior. This misadventure is the basis of the excellent Netflix series Mindhunter, by the way. Once Douglas and Ressler had their data, the question then became what to do with it. For a while, their records simply sat in cabinets at the FBI to be studied in-house but word traveled to police departments across the country that there were men at the FBI who specialized in finding serial killers using questionable methods. And sometimes that was the only option left. These desperate early cases gave the behavioral science unit the chance to prove their theories. The book, Into the Minds of Mad Men, by Don Denevy and John Campbell, documents one of these early investigations. Police in Sacramento were stumped by a series of murders that occurred there in 1978. A man named David Wallen had come home one day to find his wife, Teresa, sprawled on the kitchen floor. She'd been shot in the head, her body mutilated. 
it appeared the killer had eaten parts of her flesh. Days later, and just four blocks away, an entire family was ended. A woman lived in the house there with her father, her son, and a nephew. A neighbor found them. The father and the eight-year-old boy were shot in the head, execution style. The woman was shot in the head three times, and like Teresa, she'd been mutilated and defiled. There were signs of cannibalism again. Even worse, the second child, just 22 months, had been taken. The boy's body would be found three months later, beheaded. Due to the gruesome nature of the crimes, local police wondered if this was the work of a Manson-style satanic cult. Eventually, detectives reached out to the local FBI office for help. The man in charge there was Russell Vorpagel, and his first call was to Ressler. Because of their experience in the behavioral crimes unit, both Ressler and Vorpagel were not shocked by the brutality of these murders. They knew psychos. They knew cannibals. They understood the sort of animal that was stalking Sacramento. To catch him, they needed to better understand his victims. Like men on safari, they knew that in order to bag the lion, they needed to find the type of buffalo it stalked. Ressler and Vorpagel revisited the crime scenes. This was a white, middle-class suburb, a safe place where everyone knew each other. They interviewed neighbors and learned something that was a red flag to them, but something that meant nothing to the police. Someone in the neighborhood had been killing cats and dogs. Ressler had learned that many men who evolve into psychosexual murderers, they start by killing animals. He also noted that on the night the killer had kidnapped the toddler, he'd stolen a car to get away. This suggested he'd walked to the scene. This was no transient, as the local police had suggested. This was a local. After their review, Ressler and Vorpagel sent a weirdly specific psychological profile to the Sacramento PD. Killers white, male, 27 years old, living within a mile of the area, has probably been treated in a mental institution and recently released. He is psychotic, probably schizophrenic. He and his residents are slovenly and unkempt. Evidence of his crimes will be present. He probably tortures the animals. Detectives then returned to the neighborhood and asked neighbors if that description fit anyone they knew. It sure did. It sounded just like Richard Trenton Chase. The young man would ask people for kittens and puppies he could adopt, but then the animals were never seen again. Police learned from Chase's parents that he'd recently been released from a mental hospital and was a paranoid schizophrenic who'd gone off his meds. He was arrested and charged when his fingerprints matched the ones he left in blood at the last crime scene. He was dubbed the Vampire of Sacramento for his compulsion to drink the blood of his victims. If you want to read the specifics of Chase's crimes, you can find them on his Wikipedia page. They are by far the most disturbing and depraved details I've ever read, and it's a miracle that Douglas and Ressler were able to provide the means to catch him before he killed more people. After the trial, Ressler visited Chase in prison to interview him too. Chase explained that he'd only committed the murders to save himself. He believed that drinking the blood of his victims kept his heart beating. He also believed that his mind was controlled by Nazi war criminals flying around in UFOs. Then he reached into his pocket and handed Ressler a wad of pasta he'd taken from his lunch. The Nazis had infiltrated the prison, he explained and they were trying to poison his mac and cheese. Chase was found dead in his cell the day after Christmas in 1980. He'd hidden his antidepressants for weeks and then overdosed. Oh, one more thing. When police caught Chase, he was 27 years old, just like Douglas and Ressler had said. The vampire of Sacramento proved that the behavioral science unit might actually be some kind of science after all. In 1985, thanks to a million dollar research grant, all that information on serial killers compiled by Douglas and Ressler were put into a digital system called VICAP, the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. It was a digital database of evil, searchable by modus operandi. You've heard that phrase before, right? M-O, modus operandi? Latin for mode of operating. It's that particular style of serial killer's actions, like a signature. For Richard Trenton Chase, this involved the mutilation of women and the drinking of his victim's blood. Now, 
any police department could fill out a simple form and submit details about an unsolved crime in their jurisdiction to see if it matched details of other crimes across the country. Prior to VICAP, police had requested the FBI's help on only 192 cases. In 1986, the first year it was in use, police requested help on over 600 cases. Today, there are around a dozen FBI profilers working full-time on more than 1,000 cases every year. Psychological profiling is now a major part of many high-profile criminal investigations, but is it really ethical? This is the part of the episode where we learn a little philosophy. It's the veggies in our five-course true crime tasting menu. You'll thank me for it later when you find yourself at some boring dinner party where nobody has anything interesting to say. There was this guy, a modern philosopher, Stephen Toulman. He was married four times, so it should come as no surprise that the thing he studied most was how to win an argument. Philosophers are like the detectives of reality and reason. Like police detectives, they seek solutions to unsolved mysteries, and then they must convince others that they are right. For thousands of years, philosophers preferred to use deductive reasoning to prove their theories. Deductive reasoning begins with a general truth and uses it to explain something specific. There's a fancy-nancy word for an argument that uses deductive reasoning. It's called a syllogism. And the most popular syllogism comes from Aristotle. It goes like this. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. The deductive argument starts with a big premise, all men are mortal, then moves to a smaller premise, we still agree is true, Socrates is a man. Then it provides a conclusion to a smaller issue, which connects the two factual statements, Socrates is mortal. Deductive reasoning moves from big to small, from general to specific. But Toulmin, Toulmin didn't like this. For one, deductive reasoning like the kind Aristotle used relied on absolutes and only Sith deal in absolutes, right? Which, isn't that an absolute anyway? But I digress. Toulmin realized that deductive reasoning is short on evidence. All men are mortal, yes, probably. But where's the evidence? Is there a study you can point to? Socrates is a man. Yes, yeah, so, okay, but I never met him. Should I take your word for it? It's pedantic, but he has a point. Maybe we should start with Socrates is mortal and look for evidence to support this. A death certificate would be nice. What Toulmin did was devise a model of argumentation that was not top-down like deductive reasoning, but the opposite, a bottoms-up model, which is what we call inductive reasoning. It starts with a claim. For example, let's say we have just met a man named Mr. Wilson, and our claim is that a Mr. Wilson has been to China. The claim is backed up by grounds, which are facts, evidence, data. We can see that Mr. Wilson has a tattoo on his right arm of a fish with pink scales, and he has a Chinese coin hanging from his watch chain. Next is the most important part of Toulmin's process, the warrant. The warrant is a statement linking the claim to the grounds. It explains the reasoning, instead of relying on the reader to do so on their own. The warrant here would be a statement like, you can only get that fish tattoo in China. Then comes the backing. This is something that can certify the warrant statement. Here it could be, I know that you can only get a tattoo of a fish with pink scales like that from certain parlors in China because I have studied tattoos for years. And what's great about Toulmin's model is that it also includes room for rebuttals. It opens the argument up to be taken apart. If it still stands in spite of intelligent rebuttals, it's a good argument. In this case, a worthy rebuttal would be, but perhaps there are tattoo parlors in London that are run by artists from China, so the man would not have had to travel to China to obtain one. Claim, grounds, warrant, backing, rebuttal. To many, Toulmin proved that inductive reasoning was more trustworthy in human affairs than syllogisms. By the way, our example of the tattoo from China comes from a story titled The Red-Headed Leak, and it's how Sherlock Holmes figures out that Mr. Wilson has just returned from China. <laughs>
Turns out that Holmes, the so-called master of deduction, was not a master of deduction at all. He was actually skilled at inductive reasoning. Unfortunately, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle didn't know the difference. In fact, Doyle is not to be trusted at all. He believed in fairies for one, and he stole Holmes from Edgar Allan Poe, but that's a story for another day. What the holy hell does all this have to do with psychological profiling, you ask? Well, psychological profiling uses deductive reasoning. It starts big, we have a series of horrific murders, and tries to find a specific truth, who is responsible. And it does so with absolutely no evidence. It relies on assumptions and hunches, on the interpretation of crime data by the minds of fallible humans, who can point to a man and say, I believe he is guilty, now go prove it for me. The police then work backwards to prove their case, instead of following the evidence to the correct suspect. Psychological profiling is weak argumentation, and it's ripe for mistakes. And here, the stakes are high, and the repercussions grave. They're called the DC sniper attacks, but the killings actually started in Tacoma, Washington on February 16, 2002. That was the day 21-year-old Kenya Cook answered her door and was shot and killed by an unknown assailant. In March, 60-year-old Jerry Taylor was practicing chip shots on a golf course in Tucson when he was killed by a single shot to the chest from a long-range rifle. The killings continued randomly across the country. A man changing his tire in a parking lot in Hammond, Louisiana. A pizza shop owner in Clinton, Maryland. A liquor store clerk in Montgomery, Alabama. And then, on October 2nd, all hell broke loose in the Beltway area of Washington, D.C. At 5.20 p.m., a bullet smashed through a window at a Michael's Craft store in Aspen Hill, narrowly missing the cashier. An hour later, 55-year-old James Martin was shot and killed in a grocery store parking lot. The next day, the unseen sniper shot and killed four people in Aspen Hill. The attacks continued through October. A 43-year-old woman in a craft store parking lot in Spotsylvania, a 13-year-old walking to school in Maryland, a 47-year-old FBI intelligence analyst on a trip to the Home Depot in Arlington, Virginia. It was clear these murders would continue until the killer or killers were caught. But the victims were so random, police were at a loss for any information that could lead them to a suspect. Enter the psychological profilers. Former FBI profiler Clifton Van Zant explained these attacks were something white males do, according to an article that appeared in the Baltimore Sun. James Allen Fox, author of the book The Will to Kill, making sense of senseless murder, came up with a whole personality for the unknown fugitive. He's a weekday warrior, said Fox. Even snipers have jobs. He stops and shoots and doesn't hear the screams. Witnesses said they saw a light-colored van near the scenes of the shootings. Van Zant, sounding like a psychic reading tea leaves, predicted that the vehicle would be found in a garage or a lake. And then two men were apprehended. 41-year-old John Muhammad, and 17-year-old Lee Boy Malvo. They were homeless, living out of a Chevy sedan with a hole in the trunk they could shoot out of. During the investigation into the shootings, police and witnesses encountered Muhammad and Malvo several times and let them go because they did not match the type of person the profilers predicted. We were looking for a white van with white people, and we ended up with a blue car with black people, said D.C. Police Chief Charles Ramsey. We'll never know how many victims would be alive today if the public and police had disregarded the profiler's incorrect assertions. I should say that there was one profiler who did get a few things right. Robert Ressler warned everyone that there weren't really enough behavioral clues to accurately predict who was responsible. On Larry King Live, Ressler predicted that the sniper would not stop until he was caught, and that spree killers often traveled far. Ressler thought it was possible the killer could travel as far as Ashland, Virginia. The day after his interview, 37-year-old Jeffrey Hopper was shot in the parking lot of a Ponderosa restaurant in Ashland, Virginia. Ressler was the first FBI profiler I ever met, 
and the reason I reached out to him was because I had become convinced he fingered the wrong man for the murder of Amy Mihalovic. Fans of the podcast will know that Amy's case is the one I can't let go of. In fact, I've been obsessing over it since I was 11 years old. Amy lived one town over, in the white-collar Cleveland suburb of Bay Village. In 1989, a man abducted her from the Bay Square shopping plaza on a sunny Friday afternoon. Weeks after her disappearance, Ressler came to town. He was actually traveling the country at the time, researching a book on serial killers. And he stopped into the FBI office to offer his help. Ressler quickly honed in on one particular suspect, a troubled young man named Billy Strunak. He had volunteered his time to help find Amy. Strunak was interesting for a number of reasons, not the least of which was a prior conviction for an attempted sexual assault of a teenage girl. He also looked like the composite sketch of the man seen with Amy at the shopping plaza. Ressler and another agent dropped by Strunak's apartment and asked to come inside. They questioned him at length and found him to be evasive. My gut said this was the guy, Ressler wrote in his book, Whoever Fights Monsters. When Strunak died of an apparent suicide a week or so after Amy's body was found, it seemed to support Ressler's theory. And because of Ressler's book, many people in Cleveland thought the case had been solved. But I think he was wrong. So do detectives investigating the case. In fact, I don't even think Strunak committed suicide. Strunak arrived for work at BJ Wholesale Club one morning, complaining of stomach cramps. Soon he was throwing up and unable to stand. They rushed him to the hospital where he died a short time later. An autopsy revealed that he had ingested dry gas, that additive stuff you can put in your car for better gas mileage. The theory was that he'd committed suicide by mixing the poison in a can of Coke, which they found open in his apartment. Now, ask yourself, have you ever heard of someone committing suicide like that? And if that's really what he did, why would he go to work? There's a longer, sadder story here, but for now, let me just say I've come to believe Strunek's death was a bit of vigilante justice. And anyway, there are a number of much better suspects in Amy's case, and nobody has ever been able to show how Strunak knew Amy or the other girls who were called by her killer. The agents in charge of Amy's case were furious with Ressler because of what he wrote about the case. They think they may have missed important leads because people with information heard about his book and figured why contact the police if it was already solved. John Douglas also caught some heat late in his career as a criminal profiler. In 1997, John and Patsy Ramsey were caught up in a media storm following the death of their daughter, Jean Bonnet. Many viewed their actions with suspicion and doubted the idea of an unknown intruder. In order to clear their name, John and Patsy's lawyers hired Douglas to profile the case. Let that sink in for a moment. Regardless of whatever Douglas might find, is it ethical for a private person to pay a profiler to examine a case? Certainly, the incentive would be to give your employer the result they're hoping for, right? It sure doesn't feel right. For the record, the John Douglas profile of Jean Benet's murderer suggests a young teenage male with a personal grudge against John Ramsey committed the murder. I tend to believe Douglas, actually, but that relationship as a private profiler hired by a suspect's lawyer has the appearance of impropriety. What would have happened if Douglas had found the parents did it? Would any lawyer ever hire him again? In 2007, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a story for The New Yorker called Dangerous Minds. I'll link to it for you. If you don't mix with the literary crowds, you should know that Malcolm Gladwell is kind of a big deal. And when he calls you out in the pages of The New Yorker, you're going to have a bad day. Gladwell shined a harsh light on the romantic view of the psychological profiler we'd come to know in movies like The Silence of the Lambs. He used John Douglas's own words against him, too. Here's a piece of writing he found by Douglas in which the profiler explains what it is he does. What I try to do with a case is to take in all the evidence I have to work with and then put myself mentally and emotionally in the head of the offender. I try to think as he does. Exactly how this happens, I'm not sure, any more than the novelists such as Tom Harris who've consulted me over the years can say exactly how their characters come to life. If there's a psychic component to this, I won't run from it. 
Gladwell points out that the data Douglas and Ressler gathered as young agents, the data that is at the heart of VICAP itself, was not exactly a scientifically sound representative sample. They talked to whoever happened to be in the neighborhood, Gladwell writes, nor did they interview their subjects according to a standardized protocol. They just sat down and chatted, which isn't a particularly firm foundation for a psychological system. Gladwell goes on to show how most of the criminal profiles written on prominent cases are full of ambiguous language that only makes sense after a suspect is apprehended, much like the way the famous Nostradamus quatrains uh, about a bad man named Hister only make sense after we came to know a guy named Hitler. He even takes Douglas's profile of BTK and shows how it's full of the same language used by astrologers. Ouch. I feel like I've ruined this idea of the steadfast FBI profiler for you, and, and for that I'm sorry. I guess what this podcast is trying to do is to cause you to question the things you read. As I've said before, we live in an existential world, a world with no real closure and few answers. If anyone tells you otherwise, even if they're wearing a badge that says FBI, tell them to take a hike. Oh, one more thing. Remember the Whitechapel murders I told you about? The ones committed by the man police and profilers would later call Jack the Ripper? Dr. Thomas Bond gave us the first psychological profile of the subject when he wrote that the man responsible for the murders was, quote, quite likely to be a quiet, inoffensive looking man, probably middle-aged and neatly and respectably dressed. I think he must be in the habit of wearing a cloak or overcoat, or he could hardly have escaped noticed in the streets if the blood on his hands or clothes were visible. We met somebody that matched that description. The man Robert Paul saw standing over Mary Ann Nichols' body. That man told Paul that he just found the woman lying dead in a gateway. And when asked, he gave his name as Charles Cross. But that was a lie. His real name was Charles Allen Larchmere. He worked as a delivery man for a butcher across town, and so he would go unquestioned if there happened to be blood on his clothes. His preferred route to work took him by the locations Jack the Ripper left his victims, and he told another lie when questioned by police. He said he'd still been in the middle of the street when Paul had found him, but Paul was adamant he'd seen Charles Larchmere standing over the body. Perhaps if the police had seriously considered Dr. Bond's profile, they may have caught history's most notorious serial killer. The Philosophy of Crime is a Fearful Symmetry production. This episode was recorded by Jeff Koval at the State Level Recording Studio in Fairlawn, Ohio. It was produced and edited by William Mankey. I'm James Renner. If you enjoyed this podcast, please visit jamesrenner.com, where you can find links to the other stuff I do, including virtual reality journalism. I also currently host Lake Erie's Coldest Cases for Discovery ID, and you can find every episode on idgo.com. My latest novel, Muse, will be published in May. You can order Muse and my other books online or anywhere books are sold. William Mankey also writes the music for this podcast. Check out his other creation, Genius Dice, wooden dice that will give an artful twist to your gaming night, available to order on Amazon or also Wood If. Dot com. Until next time, remember, there's a simple but challenging solution to the epidemic of crime. If everyone took the time to make good friends with their neighbors, we would know when someone needs our help before they become a statistic. Don't be fearful of the world. Make friends and make it better. You're going to have a bad day. You're asking for trouble. You're asking for trouble. You're gonna have a bad day. That certificate would be nice. You're gonna have a bad day. That certificate would be nice. That certificate would be nice. You're asking for trouble. You're asking. You're asking for trouble. You're asking for trouble. You're asking for trouble. You're asking for trouble. You're gonna have a bad day. That certificate would be nice. You're gonna have a bad day. That certificate would be nice. You're gonna have a bad day. 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 Death certificate would be nice. Death certificate would be nice. Death certificate would be nice. Death death certificate would be nice. Death certificate would be nice. Death death certificate would be nice. Trouble, 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 trouble.